Hello and welcome to Let's Talk HR with Dr. Deneen, the talk show about all things HR. It's often said a company's culture can make or break the organization. Organizational culture has been defined as a company's values, the intentional formation of a supportive work environment, or how a company operates when no one is watching. One thing for sure, according to FIERCE, a leadership development organization, an unhealthy culture will stifle strategic progress and impede the overall employee experience in the workplace. So I have a question for you. Does your organizational culture live up to what you say it is? That's the question every employer has to answer. But if I can show you how to cultivate an effective organizational culture in 15 minutes of less, would you be interested? Well, Brad Fetterman will show us how in his new book, Cultivating Culture, 101 Ways to Foster Engagement in 15 Minutes or Less. Welcome, Brad. Well, thank you for having me. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. I am so glad you are here today, and we cannot wait to get into 101 Ways to Cultivate Culture. So, you're a best-selling author, a thought leader, leadership coach, expert in organizational culture, and much more. So tell us about your career journey. How how did you come about to get to the place you are? Wow. Well, you know, I, I thought about my career in segments. You know, when I was first going to college, I wanted to get into organizational change, organizational development work. And I, I really looked for a, something to major in that would allow me to do that. And I ended up going into organizational communication and development. And from there, I actually started working for an external consulting firm, which is now called Accenture. Ah, and we yeah. did organizational change work. Mm -hmm. um, it was important for me though, to know all of HR. So I, I backtracked and I went to another organization and I worked internally doing things like orientation, comp work, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things to get a real feel for, you know, HR, you know, at the at the core level. And when I've got enough experience, I thought I need to get my uh, master's degree. So okay. I went back and I got my master's degree at Bandy, which is my venture down south. Oh yeah. And I was originally an East Coast boy, right? Yes. So, um, and when I got my master's in human resource development at Bandy, I then did uh, work, actually contract work in Tokyo for a little while. Wow. And then came back and worked for Humana Inc. Um, uh -huh. And I ran their management development and, and really focused on how they could grow their business faster using talent. And uh, was there for a while and I got a wonderful phone call from someone that said, we need to talk to you about a job. Okay. And I said, I'm doing great. I'm not leaving. And they said, look, someone we know, mutually know, mm -hmm. said you should look at this. Mm -hmm. And they told me who it was. So I looked at the position and I said, I'll take a closer look. And sure enough, I started working for them. That company was based in Memphis. Ah. And I first started working for them in the field in Washington, DC. It was uh -huh. called Behavioral Technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and essentially came here to help the leader of that company, the founder of the company, find a, an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. We grew the company, we found an exit strategy, he sold it, and then I still had to do something. Wow. You know, I had to figure out what I was gonna do. And so I started my own company. Mm -hmm. Based on everything I'd learned internally and externally, I said, I think I have something <coughs> to add. <coughs> And quite frankly, uh, one of the things I wanted to change that was out there was I thought there were a lot of organizations that were relying on 1970s and 80s research and models. Right. And I felt like it was, oh, the organizations today do not look like the organizations from 1980. Right. So we needed different models. And so part of my effort starting the company was not just to start an organization, it was to start an organization that was more relevant to what was happening in today's work environment than we had in the past. Wow, so, that is amazing, thank amazing. You. But let me tell you where I remember you. Uh -oh. uh, back in 2014 <laughs> or so, um, my organization at the time sent me through Leadership Memphis. You were one of the facilitators there. So oh, wow. that was my first contact with you. This is a wonderful journey that you've thank had, you. and we are so fortunate to have you in the HR, you. HR industry. Now, before we get into the 101 ways okay. to cultivate, I want to kind of set the I foundation. I don't have all memorized though, so you know what I'm <laughs> I want to kind of set the foundation sure. for organizational culture. So what do you say 
is the definition of organizational culture and how do you really cultivate it? Sure, I think to me, the definition of, of, of culture really is, it's, it's the behaviors we're willing to accept, you know, not the ones that we espouse. Mm -hmm. I think that is a huge um, concept that people forget about. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we might say we have cultural expectations, values, et cetera, mm -hmm. And we might expect them from some people, mm -hmm. and we might give one or two people a pass, depending on what their position is, mm -hmm. what they do for the organization. We aren't what we expect from all those other people. We are what we're willing to accept from just those few. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it really is imperative that organizations think we are as strong as our weakest link. Wow, yeah, that is interesting. So when you put that into context, in the organization, you are as strong as your weakest link. Who can that be? Is that employees? Is it the executive team? Who are those people? I think the it's weakest link. I think it's everybody now. And and what I mean by that is we are now in organizations that are flatter. The hierarchy is dead or dying. Mm -hmm. um, we're more networked. Mm -hmm. We're dispersed. And the research is showing that colleagues, co-workers, mm -hmm. have as much or more influence on whether you want to stay or go, what your experience is like, than your manager. In uh -huh. some cases, you're working side by side with co-workers and your manager might be in a different part of the country mm -hmm. or even a different part of the world, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I would say to you that I think everybody has the ability to influence culture, to build culture up, and they also have the ability to tear it down. And so everybody counts. Kind of sounds like everybody's responsible for culture, but we'll come back to that. Sure. Now to this 101 ways to <laughs> cultivate culture. Tell us how we do that. Or tell sure. us some of those ways. Let's sure. start with that. You know, this concept was born out of, out of a couple of ideas. One was everybody is responsible. Culture is something that has to be shared. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have relied very much on top-down kinds of initiatives, events, right, to spread culture. Mm -hmm. You go to so many companies and you see culture on the walls, mm -hmm. it's on the website, yeah. and yet it's not revisited, it's not alive. And culture is something that's a living, breathing thing. And so as we went around and worked with clients, what we found is there was a big discrepancy between what they said mm. and what they did, right? So I would go in and, and there'd be beautiful values on the wall, cultural statements on the wall, things like, our people are number one, mm -hmm. um, or we respect our people even under the most difficult mm -hmm. times, right? And yet you'd find people berated in the hallways. Or wow. you'd go to meetings and you'd watch a meeting and you never once discussed people. Mm -hmm. Customers are number one, Customers are, we're customer focused, and you don't discuss customers. What we found was they were discussing technical issues, problems, wow. those kind of projects. And, and so you are what you discuss. Mm -hmm. You are what you spotlight. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we set out to say, look, in no matter what conversation you're having, you've got to weave the culture through the fabric of your company. It means it needs to be part of training. It needs to be part of performance appraisals. It needs to be part of your meetings, uh -huh. right? Yes. And so we built a uh, a model and a process. We actually have over 500 activities and conversations. Oh. We only put 101 in the book. <laughs> uh, we pulled out 101, used 101, and essentially we help companies uh, drive culture through conversations they can have mm -hmm. in meetings, stand-up meetings, huddles, or regular meetings mm -hmm. in 15 minutes or less. Some of them take five or 10 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but it's quick, it's fast. And not only that, a manager can facilitate that meeting or an employee could facilitate that part of the meeting. Right. And we even give people an agenda of the types of things that they need to have in that meeting to make sure they're reflecting culture mm -hmm. and the people aspect of the company. Okay, so tell me about these team huddles. Sure. That sounds really, really interesting. The team huddle. Yeah. So is it something that happens daily, weekly, or when a certain event comes? When does it happen? Well, I think every company <laughs> and, and in different roles should have a cadence. Mm -hmm that cadence can differ depending on, you know, the situation. So when we work with hotels and we're out in the field, um, they're doing it every day. 
-hmm. You work with uh, uh, some organizations, you might be doing it weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing companies, usually you're doing a shift meeting or a huddle at the beginning of the, of the shift. Mm -hmm. And then in other cases, in corporate environments, you're probably looking at those things happening about once a month. Mm -hmm. But the key is have a regular cadence and don't wait for just an event, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's, that's what's most important. Are we revisiting the things that are most important to us? Yes. Are we on the same page? You know, one of the things that's really interesting is we have five generations in the workplace. Yes. We've got more diversity in the workplace than we've ever had. And you, you have less shared norms. You know, yes. I use an example. Um, I went and opened the door for one woman and I, I received a thank you for being so polite. Mm -hmm. I opened the door for another woman somewhere else and I was um, yelled at for being chauvinistic. You, you don't know what to do anymore, right? <laughs> right. We don't have shared values. Yeah. And so the reality is, how do you create those? Well, you create those by agonizing or working through or conversing about things and getting on the same page. Mm -hmm. What does being customer focused for us mean? I'll give you a personal example. Okay. Our mission mm -hmm. is to inspire others to discover and live their possible. Okay, I love that. Yeah, well, I, and I, Blacks, I, I like it, it too. Um, we don't just think about that for our clients. Mm -hmm. We think about it for ourselves as well. So the other day we had a meeting and one of the conversations we had was, if that's our mission, mm -hmm. then how is that true for us? Yes. And everybody looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, well, we need to know what is your possible? Mm -hmm. What is your possible? And everyone here needs to talk about what they want to be. Okay. And how can each of us help you. And so the next week we came back and we talked about each other's wants, mm -hmm. dreams, desires in your career, what you want to do here, beyond here, and how we could help each other. Wow. Now we have a shared expectation mm -hmm. of what we need and what we want and how we can help each other. That doesn't happen unless you put the time in to mm -hmm. have that conversation. And people love to, um, they love to, to go to what they want to happen or what they want to see happen for sure. them, right? They want to be able to have those steps on how to do that. And it sounds like you all um, are in a collaborative way, making things happen for people. That's engagement. Yeah. That's a retention strategy. Yeah. Doing those things that people want to do and then helping them get there. I yeah. think that's awesome. Well, thank you very much. I mean, the whole concept is building a culture has to be shared. And the only way you share it is through a two-way dialogue. Oh, and good. most of the time, unfortunately, in organizations, you see a one-way dialogue. Mm -hmm. You see a top-down dialogue. Yes. And when we watch meetings and, and huddles, all too often, you've got one person kind of sharing, here's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now go off and do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that really didn't build anything. Mm -hmm. It made that person who led the meeting feel good. Yes. But not everybody sees it the same way that person did. They didn't interpret the same way that person interprets it. Unless you're talking through it and working through it, you don't know. Absolutely. And then you find out you have problems later. Right. So. That engagement piece. Yes. Having your employees to be able to give that feedback, to be able to feel free to give their feedback. Absolutely. Uh, that is a way that you can bring people together, bring the organization together and everybody on the same page. Absolutely. That. Now you mentioned something about diversity and inclusion and how it should be part of your your, your culture. How do you make that part of your culture? Sure, I mean, the first thing I would say is I, I wanna talk about it because I think there are, unfortunately we've gotten to a place where we have two groups of people that mm -hmm. are monopolizing the conversation, the agenda. We have one group that basically says, we don't have an issue, which we, we do. We do. We do. We and then you have another group that when people make a mistake or when they see things differently, the automatic um, approach is let's cancel them, let's tear them down, let's destroy them. Mm -hmm. And what concerns me is we've lost this art of conversation and learning, right? Mm -hmm. What if somebody does something un unintentional and they have an opportunity to have their eyes opened in a productive way? Yes. If we tear them down, that goes away. We've lost somebody. And so I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to, uh, uh, when we talk about culture being part of the, uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion being part of the culture, we need to think about it from a broad perspective. What do I mean by that? We need to start with what the goal and objective is in mind. Um, too often you have companies that go straight to, let's have an initiative around women. Let's mm -hmm. have an initiative around African-Americans. And it becomes this 
stilted, segmented approach to trying to make a group feel good or happy, okay. right? What we really should be doing is we should be saying to ourselves, how do we create a culture where everyone feels safe, valued, and respected consistently? Yes. If we start there and we build out, it's a much better, much better product. It's a much better process and it's a much better outcome. We want to create inclusion for everyone. everybody. Everybody. We want yeah. to create an environment where everyone feels comfortable. And you know what? Sometimes when you think of diversity and inclusion, it surprises you. I went to a, a company and I worked with them. And the, one of the saddest things I saw was they valued extroversion. Huh. People that spoke yes. and spoke up right. and they were right. And the introverts mm -hmm. got left behind when jobs were available. They weren't picked, mm -hmm. right? Because they didn't speak up, wow. but they may have been the better suited person for that for role. Yeah. And so sometimes diversity, equity, inclusion has a lot to do with personality styles, the way mm -hmm. people communicate. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at diversity, equity, inclusion from a variety of angles. Yes. To do that, we need to start with the end in mind, that broader goal. The end in mind, you're, you're getting it here, cultivating culture in 101 ways. Now let's turn it just a little bit. Sure. So when we talk about culture and engagement, a lot of time, those things happen when you're in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you're engaging with your coworker, with your peers, your supervisors, but we are now in a remote, right, environment. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we engage and cultivate culture remotely? Well, I think there's two things I would say to that. The first one is use your tools. We've gotten used to having meetings via Zoom and Teams and everything else. And so there is no reason why those conversations, those activities can't be done in a virtual kind of environment. The day that we stop trying is the day that the culture takes a retreat. Wow. That's the first yeah. one I would say. The second thing I'd say is I'm really concerned because we're coming back to work. And yes. I'm hearing wonderful stories about companies saying, come back in two weeks or here's the date. And, <laughs> and here's what I'm not hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing the why. I'm not hearing what, what makes being in an office special, right? You see, if I were asking a bunch of people to come back, what I would say is, I wouldn't ask them. What I would do is I would say, how do we make the office environment a place of camaraderie? a place of culture building, a place, mm -hmm. place of collaboration, a place where people want to be, mm -hmm. right? And then you begin that process and people will ask to come back. Wow. Have and, you experienced that? Oh, of course. My whole team came back. They came back early because they wanted to be together because being right. in the office together met a need. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've seen it at certain client sites as well. So yes, I do see it but you, that takes thought, it takes intentionality. Mm -hmm. And I think all too often we're thinking about masks, we're thinking about uh, antiseptics, we're thinking about desk sizes and mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about why should people be here, mm -hmm. right? And we have to remember when people come back, they lose a sense of freedom, not just from being stuck in an office space, mm -hmm. but now peers, managers, and other people are watching them. They're yes. used to being able to work in total freedom. Right. So if you're gonna ask them to come back, Give them a great reason and give them a great experience to come back. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You learned it here today. That's what we do. So let's do this. What is the one thing HR professionals should know about handling issues of culture? Wow. It's not their job. <laughs> I mean, they are a facilitator and a helper, mm -hmm. but I think all too often culture gets placed in the lap of HR. It's it your does. responsibility, it right? Yes. But the problem is, I said it was shared earlier. Mm -hmm. And if it's not being done in a dispersed way throughout the organization, if managers aren't playing that, playing their part, mm -hmm. if employees aren't playing their part, then uh, it's not going to happen. Wow. And HR can't make that happen. And mm -hmm. so I think HR needs to be responsible to help make it easier, mm -hmm. to provide support, mm -hmm. to maybe help give guidance. Mm -hmm. But they shouldn't take it on as theirs. Okay. So it should be a team effort. It should be a team effort. effort. And so how would um, the executive team uh, explain that to the population, the employee population, uh, in building the brand that you belong here, you are included, we're trying to build this culture around you. How would an executive team um, funnel that um, to an employee population? 
Well, I think the first thing is uh, they need to be very clear about what the culture is. Mm -hmm. It starts with them. Mm -hmm. They also need to be clear about how the culture connects to strategy and mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, all too often you've got these wonderful values that sit on the sidelines, but they have no connection whatsoever to what the business is and what they're doing. Someone has to draw that line, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's that really is up to executive leadership. And then I think the executive leadership needs to sponsor, I use the term sponsor, um, culture initiative that is not an event or a process mm -hmm. that has a start and finish, but it's an ongoing process ongoing that process. never that never finishes. ends. Never ends. Never ends. Yeah. And and they need to set that expectation with uh, their managers, their supervisors, their team leads, um, and with everyone else in the organization. And the last thing I tell you is that they need to role model it. It is not okay for yeah. an executive to say, here's our culture, and then not live up to it. One of my most interesting experiences was a company that was struggling. Um, they had terrible engagement scores on their engagement survey, and they brought us in after we did their survey for them mm -hmm. and asked for help. As it turned out, they had these wonderful values, mm -hmm. respecting employees, et cetera, but the executives weren't necessarily living up to that. Uh -huh. Okay. They would be known to berate employees, to curse an employee out. When there's a problem, wow. they would yell at an employee. And so we came up with a three strikes you're ruled out. <laughs> three for strikes executives, rule, you're out. For executives, the first strike, they got a warning. The second strike, they got a training plan and a coach. Uh -huh. And the third strike, they got let go. And let me just tell you, one executive was fired. Wow. Because of cultural reasons. Mm -hmm. And they would never have touched that mm -hmm. executive before. They would have allowed them to keep doing it, but right. they knew they had a problem. And then after that, everybody got in line and the world changed. Mm -hmm. And a year later, mm -hmm. their scores were dramatically different. Wow. And not only that, they had an $11 million shift to the bottom line and they tied it to the engagement work and the cultural shift that they made. Wow. Yeah. Just with a few changes. Yeah. Just with a few changes. That is great. Before we leave, you got to give us two activities that oh. a person or that a company can do today that would um, that would encourage and change the culture. Sure. Two I, things. I think uh, one one thing I might do is I might do I, I love doing activities that get people to do things. So uh, I actually have people draw what the team looks like right now. Okay. Okay. Now, when I say that, I, I don't want them to draw a literal picture. I right. want them to come up with kind of a metaphor. For okay. It, right. Yeah. And and then, um, I want them to draw a picture of what they would like the team to look like. Uh -huh. How would it? How should it operate? Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they all share the pictures and explain them. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen people do a big caboose, mm -hmm. right, with these small little cars behind uh -huh. it, saying one person really runs the show, uh -huh. and the rest of us are kind of <laughs> along for the ride. You know, wow. I've seen all I've seen silos, all kinds of things, and but when you look at and you have a team of five or six or mm -hmm. ten people or whatever the case may be, and they do it, you see themes. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at what they like the team to look like, you see themes. And the great aspect about that is you can take the difference between those two pictures, and you can say, here's where we are, here's where we want to be. How do we bridge the gap? That's a beautiful conversation to have with your team. An absolutely. absolutely beautiful conversation. That is a clever way. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that. Not at all. You Not draw all. what you see and then where you want to be. Absolutely. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for coming today, Brad. This is wonderful. I already have my copy and it is called Cultivating 100 Ways to Foster Engagement in 15 Minutes or Less. Get it on Amazon. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, <laughs> any major resell, a bookseller has it. And if you want to buy bulk, because this is an incredible book for team leads, supervisors, and managers, yes. contact us and we will take care of it for you. All right. All right. That's the way to do it. Get your copy. You need it in your library at work, right? So we'll, we have learned to cultivate culture today in 15 minutes or less. We learn from Brad that culture can be built into daily and weekly activities of your organization, whereby strengthening the engagement of employees and reinforcing the key principles to make 
the desired culture a reality. As HR professionals, it's important to partner with leadership and employees to exercise your voice in influencing intentional engagement and building the winning organizational culture you want. Be sure to watch Let's Talk HR with Dr. Deneen every second and fourth Friday on the YouTube channel of the same name. I encourage you also to go to Sherm Memphis's website and register to attend the Sherm Legal Conference in April. You don't want to miss it. And if you want to get away, go to the Tennessee Sherm website to register for the Strategic Business and Leadership Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Dr. Deneen Lester, and remember, HR forever. See you next time.